uh, touching end of my screens. That's very nice. Thank you. Uh, they, uh, uh, it's great honor to be here on a hot day, and uh, I know this is not your normal weather, right? It's, uh, it's quite hot, and so you'd rather be spending time with me on outside, so this is nice. I, I would really like to invite you to think yourself today as a parent, not as a teacher, and uh, you, you have children, right, do you? Most of you do, okay. If, uh, just think about yourself as a, as a parent, because uh, I really believe from a selfish perspective, whatever education you want to give to your own children should be the education we give to other people's children. So th let's start from there. So everything I said today really is based on my own understanding and research about the kind of education I want to give to my own children. And this is, as, a, as an example, uh, this is my daughter. It's, uh, you can probably tell, and uh, you can imagine, what, when you have a child like this, what are you going to do about them, right? It's, uh, and so uh, I, I, I know you work very hard as educators and as parents. You, you want the best education for your children. Uh, the problem is that uh, what is a good education? You know, what makes the best education? I mean, here you, you, you are in New South Wales, you have the uh, state curriculum, the national curriculum, you have NAPLAN, you got all these measures. Everybody claims to want the best education for their own children. I don't think you've seen anybody say, I want really to give you a bad education today, you know. Now, have you run into any politicians telling you that? No, they want the best, right? So, but what makes the best education? How do you measure that? What, what makes a great education? You know, I have, a, I have another child, so this is my outcome measure for good education. Let's just agree to this one, is that, that uh, uh, I have another child is, uh, who is uh, just 25. I think it's gonna be 26. And, uh, and he went to the University of Chicago and uh, went there to be, he tried to study economics, okay? That's very Chinese major, okay? All Chinese study economics or business and, or medicine, something like that. It's, uh, so he was trying to be a good Chinese student. And, uh, and uh, so, but after two years, he, uh, he got into the best university. University of Chicago is a great university, very expensive, and one of the best places for economics. But after two years in, uh, in university, he said, uh, Dad, I don't want to study economics anymore. I said, why? Because, uh, he said, there are too many Asians in economics. And, uh, it's, uh, as you know, that's uh, probably not a very good uh, reason for not studying something, right? It's, uh, and uh, I said, well, tell me the real reason. He said, well, because my math is not as good as theirs. Now, what do you do? I said, no, well, that's, that's good. I said, I have always endorsed, I've always supported people who can run away from the, what they're not good at. So if you, that's actually my life story. I always want to encourage people to run away from what they're not good at. And so I said, now what do you want to do? He said, well, I just took this great art history class. And uh, it's fascinating, art history. I said, yeah, I said, okay, sure, sure, why not? Why, why, why don't you? In high school, he was actually pretty good at art history and uh, uh, European history. So I said, sure, go, go for history. But I said, uh, you know, you know, you can study whatever you like. I really don't care. But uh, one condition that when you graduate, you cannot come back to live in my basement. So that, that's my definition of a good education. It's, that is, uh, a, a good education keeps other people's children out of their basement. It's, uh, and uh, so you stay out of your parents' basement. Okay. Uh, maybe, maybe, or some, somewhere, you know, so everybody, you got to stay out of your parents' basement. You know, that's a pretty good definition, because you have all other definitions, NAPLAN, ATAR, you know, HSC, all the scores, university ready, ready for this, ready for that, it's ready to move out of your parents' basement. What does that mean? It means independence. You know, we, we, in, in edu education, we can debate about everything. Education is about happiness, about economical advancement. As an Just forget about all of those things. The most important thing, you have to be an independent person. And it's before you contribute to anything else, you have to be independent. You need to not become a burden of something. So independence really comes from three sets of skills or knowledge or talents. That is, number one, you can be financially independent. 
financially, that means you can do something that somebody is willing to pay for your food or shelter or clothing, right? That's, I think that's very basic. You can do something that's valuable to somebody, valuable. And then number two, you are able to manage yourself as a psychologically healthy human being. So you do not have to cry every five minutes when you say something or when you call your mother every five seconds, you know, send your laundry home using UPS. That's not a good thing. That's a, and the third set is I call a, a simple social independence. That is, you are able to become a member of a community, whatever community that might be, right? That community could be living in a f- apartment, do you call it flats here, you know, or apartments, or, or whatever you want to be, or as a group member. But today, I actually want to only talk about the first one, because education has not even been able to deliver the first one, the financial independence. Equip our children with the skills and knowledge that will, get, well, that will make them a valuable member that can create value in other people's lives. That's, that's what uh, I think the, the trouble we face today. I think we, especially in Newcastle, you've seen this, right? Unemployment, generational unemployment. And uh, we have um, every place. That's really a dangerous thing is that, so, so education has not really done that job very well. And if you look around, globally speaking, we have uh, youth unemployment everywhere. Youth unemployment everywhere. Let's see, uh, in Australia, we got uh, youth unemployment. And uh, you can see this is uh, last year's data. It's not getting very well. This is called, here's a new high. It's people locked out of workforce. This is Australia. And this is America. We call it... uh, is a national crisis in the U.S. right now. It's youth unemployment. And U.S. right now, we got over 50% of university graduates are unemployed or underemployed. You know, underemployment is very tough to think about. That is, if you went to University of Newcastle, you majored in chemistry, but your job is uh, working for Starbucks. You know, they have a good name. It's called barista, but it doesn't pay much. In, you know, that, right? It's, uh, oh, yeah, as a chemistry major, you're making cocktail in a bar. That's, uh, but, you know, chemistry is related, but doesn't make the cocktail drink and taste any better. Uh, so, but if you come to America, we, we can be proudly uh, telling you that uh, America has the best educated generation of taxi drivers and bartenders now. It's, uh, it's, uh, uh, but you, you go to Sydney, you, go, you, you ask a lot of drivers. Do you, you notice that? It's amazing. It means university degrees is no direct bridge to employment today. And this is happening in the UK, a 20th uh, year high. This is happening in China. This is, imagine China. And this is happening in Korea. Nobody is free from this problem. So what is the problem? Are we really poorly educating our children or are we educate them in a wrong way? I think education overall, globally speaking, has been improving. You have done actually a pretty good job in a traditional way. Of, you've improved. Education action today is definitely better than it was 20 years ago, globally speaking. More children have been educated in a traditional, I mean, schooled. However, we have been educating our children for, new, for a society that doesn't exist anymore. This is the problem. We have been miseducating them. And as you can tell, the more we miseducate them, the better and then the worse the situation will become. That, that's, it's a, so when you are working so hard to make your children do certain things, you want to ask the question, is it really helping them or is it hurting them? And this is the big question we want to ask. Is that, like, for example, NAPLAN. Is NAPLAN delivering something you really want or is actually destroying you or distracting you from doing something that really matters? Okay, you want to ask this question. You know, you work so hard every day to make sure children learn what you want to teach them. But is what you teach them going to help them to live out of their parents' basement? So that, that's the question we want to ask today. And then what happened? It's actually nothing new. Society has always gone through major transformations. At a certain times, some of those transformations can be so big that we need a paradigm shift. Sometimes it can be so big we need a paradigm shift. Most of the time, it doesn't. We need incremental improvement. You can improve. 
But occasionally, it comes time, improvement doesn't work anymore, you need transformation. It's, uh, so when people tell you about data-driven teaching, evidence-based education, but you have to think about data only works within certain paradigms. Sometimes the data becomes nonsense. Let me tell you about something about data, okay? Uh, I, I was uh, like, uh, um, Graham was saying, I was born in a little village. I have to tell you this. It's, uh, my family has the tradition of running away from something you're not good at. So, so this, this, is, uh, this is, I was born in this uh, Sichuan province. This is, uh, that's the mountains I was in, but this is a beautified version already. Okay, it's, it's not real, it's dramatized version. And, and in this house, this is the real house I was born in. And uh, so in the 1960s, I was born to become a, a farm boy, you know, a peasant boy. And I wasn't good at any of those jobs. You know, the NAPLAN or the, 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 the core curriculum in my village was, uh, was driving a water buffalo like this, you know. I was horrible at this thing. You know. If they had a not plan water buffalo driving, I would be scoring the lowest percentile. And, and, uh, and so, so I, I said, you know, I, I decided to tell my father, I said, hey, I'm not going to do this thing. And I was weak, I was small, I was bullied all the time, can't climb trees, can't deal with my father, just, just go to school, you know, just get out of here. It's, uh, and that, that's how I said I ran away from my village. So I'm happy to report now I'm, uh, I'm an all right professor, but if I had stayed, if my father had given me remediation, forced me to tutor me on water buffalo driving, I might have become the worst peasant in China left in behind. So, so I'm happy to report. But, you know, once a peasant, always a peasant, so I remember this data idea. Uh, imagine, uh, by the way, the following is, is not real, but could be real, okay. So data. My father buys a chicken, or just any farmer can buy a chicken, and uh, you feed the chicken at 7 o'clock in the morning. So again, from the chicken's perspective, you begin to collect data. You want to say, when do I get fed? And if day one, it's 7 o'clock. The day two, the chicken said, oh, well, that worked yesterday. I'm going to go there again. You collect second point of data. It gets fed. Third day, fourth day, you become more and more confident. That's the, some of the instructional method you, you're told, right? If you do this, you get this score, you'll do this. Scientific research, remember those things? So you think all this will improve. You did the more of this, the more you do it, the better you get. So the chicken gets, yeah, I go there every day and uh, get fed, seven o'clock. It's pretty good data. If you look, it's a perfect correlation, but until the day the Chinese New Year's come, <laughs> and the farmer or my father decides to eat the chicken, you go there seven o'clock, you get caught, you get killed and data doesn't work anymore after that. So that's what, how things happen in, in life. You know, most of the things if you see that's gonna be linear until it doesn't work. So if you look at human history, how many of those points have we gone through in terms of work? Not many, but it definitely has happened. You look at this, this is the, um, over the last 200 years of job changes, of industry changes, that's 1800, so if you look at the green line around 1850, 1860, if you were still thinking about becoming a better farmer, that's probably a bad idea, okay? This actually happened in China in 1970, 1980s. So when you were seeing the factories popping up, you're still trying to say, let's keep our children become better farmers. That's probably a bad idea, right? So that's called paradigm shift. You see this sharp decline. Now today, it's about 3% people working forestry, any natural source, you know, uh, uh, kind of uh, extraction. It's like coal down here, right, Newcastle. Then what become popular is become employed by somebody. You go work for other people. Because around that time, industrial revolution took over, a bunch of uh, people created new jobs. They created jobs for many other people. So we, most of us said, oh, we're going to become an employee. And that's today's modern education evolved. We evolved to prepare people to work for others on very similar jobs, okay? And then you can see that's shifting starting with about 1970s. That's where the drop begins. So what's on the rise? That's the issue. So because all our education was designed to prepare workers. You know what kind of workers we have? What kind of workers? We started education, designing education, or our mindset came from like this. 
So that's they said, okay, education is going to help our children find a job. Then so government and smart people and not so smart people, but generally old people and uh, get into curriculum committees, you know, that's what we call or curriculum authorities. They get together, they said, you know, it'd be great if we know what the workforce is like. So let's talk about business, they talk to employers, so what kind of people they want. So you go there studying mm, what kind of skills and knowledge do they need to fill in the workforce. Very logical, okay? So you study this, uh, you study this, you study this, you study this. You say, huh, we think they need to read, right? Okay, that's, that's agreed, L literacy. We think they need some basic counting, that's numeracy. And then we think they need to be able to read, follow directions, instructions. That's how we do the whole thing. That's how. So we, we come up with those ideas, and so we, we talk about workers, you know, so that's, that's what we had. And now, come back together, and so let's write a curriculum. So that's what the curriculum is written, and so this is how education is like. So this is what it's about. So we have the prescribed outcome, whatever is important, we ever so write them, then we make sure John, as a, you know, the dean of the School of Education, or the head of a School of Education, you make sure teachers know more than students know what needs to be, and help make sure they can transmit. So we assume all students come to school knowing nothing, because children are not like that. You know, children are not born, no children are born like this, remember? So what kind of children when they come to our school like? These are our children, remember this? So these are our children. Our children come to school like this. We want to turn them into this. What do you do? You use curriculum, you use assessment, you use good teachers to do those things because we, this is what we want to do. We shift them and so we change them. This is what our job, our traditional school was. That's what we did. We homogenize students. We try to change, change them and every child because when you compare from that to this, there's a deficit. They're not the same. You know, they, they don't look like. Our children are very different from each other. As you probably know, our children are very different, your own children. How are we different? We're different in height, different in physical build. Some of you are taller than others. Some of you are bigger than others. Some of you run faster than others. This difference has no meaning unless we put it in a specific context. For example, if, if like people like me, I would never feel I'm, I'm at a disadvantage until I try to play Australian football, right? If I go try there in front of those guys, I say, man, that's bad. So my height becomes a problem. Do you see what I mean? And, but if I try to play ping pong, those guys will be worse. Remember those big guys? Make them play ping pong or play, do uh, gymnastics. Did you try those guys? Get one of your Australian football players to play gymnastics, and I think they'll kill each other. But, but, so you say, this difference has no meaning until it's task specific. Though this is only one dimension of difference, but we can also differ in other domains. What other domains? Think about cognitively. How are we doing? This is uh, no news anymore. Cognitively, we are, we are we're differently smart. This is Howard Gardner talks about this uh, when Graham mentioned my book. This is old classic theory now about we're differently smart. You know, differently smart doesn't mean you cannot learn something. It means you are born with certain propensity to be better at something, better learning at something. I'm sure some of you, math may become easier to you than to your brothers. And some of you may be easy, music comes easier to you than, let's say, uh, physics. Do you, you notice that? So this is called aptitude. That if you're born with the capacity, the talent, you're likely to learn something in that area faster and become better at that. This is not trying to deny the idea of the growth mindset. The growth mindset, actually, human beings, we truly can learn anything if we put our mind and time into it. Now, the big question is that, the big question, if we all spend the same 10,000 hours on something, if you spend it on something you're really good at, you get really great. If you spend it on something you're really horrible at, you will improve, you have learned, but you are probably mediocre, you know, like, you know, I guess I'm doing the same example. I'm very bad with my body, physical movement. That's why in, when I graduated from university, I had to 
bribed my teachers to let me graduate because I couldn't move my body according to, to meet the national standards, which one of them included like bouncing your ball, balancing your ball for volleyball for 82 or 32 times. I could do maximum three with running around a mile. Just, just, uh, I, I just couldn't do, I could improve. I promise after 10,000 hours, I can bounce 10. But that's not going to make me a professional volleyball player. Do you notice that? that, that. So you can become mi mediocre. This is the thing. You got to remember this thing. And also acknowledge this. Yes, we can all learn, but not, we can all learn to paint. But not all of us can become a Picasso. You say, well, that's the difference. So, so do you fix the deficit or do you want to enhance your strength? This is one thing. Another area we are very different is motivation or passion or instinct. You know, you, when you, everybody is born to pursue something. This is the origin. People always enjoy doing certain things. And we call this the basic motivational factors. And the, this is uh, from Stephen Rice. Psychologist talks about 16 basic human motivators. If you look through this, not all of you want the same thing in life. Not all of this excites you the same way as excites other people. Imagine your own children or children in your classroom. Some of them are much more motivated by power. You know, you probably have run into some kids who always like to boss other people around. Have you noticed those kids, right? Always tell other people what to do. But at the same time, you have plenty of kids who are happy to follow. Do you notice that? That's, so that's the born, because this is called passion, the origin of passion, that when you are doing something that follows your motivator, you gain energy from that. You really gain energy. From and you can be forced to do things that are against your interest, but you will hate it. You lose energy. So we can all be trained to do something. Like for some people, some kids are much more curious than others. So don't assume everybody's equally curious about the, the same thing. Some kids just, have you seen some children who love just to read a book? Who kept asking questions, why do birds fly? Then you will have another bunch of kids come over and say, why do you even care about that stupid question? Do you, have you seen those people? And then you, you, you move down this. Some people are very much into ordering things. Organization, you know, orderly. Have you run into people who absolutely get very mad at you if you put a coffee cup on the wrong side of the table? Have you, have you seen those? Have you seen people who actually gain energy by putting things in order? Have you seen people really who love to do color coding and color coding the color codes, you know, of those things? It's, uh, you must have seen those people, right? It's, uh, and some people just can care less about this. Others may be driven by the idea of saving things. And, you know, some people like to collect things. They just never, just makes them feel good that collect stuff. Do you know those things? And others like to keep nothing in their closet. So if you go through this whole thing, we're differently motivated, differently Differently passionate about, about things. Now, again, we can make, I can make you do things you don't like, but that's just not cool. You, you hate it, and you can still force you to do it. You know, like uh, physical activity, for example, is something I really absolutely don't like at all. It's, uh, and then, however, in our traditional thinking, we like to believe everybody's the same. You know, we think they, they, they want the same thing. So causes a lot of uh, family disputes in you and your spouse, and you think they should, why don't you do this stuff I do, you know? And problem with your kids, you know, why don't you enjoy what I enjoy? We have the same thing. So like, for example, physical activity, as uh, I was a grandma was saying, I, I live in a place called uh, Eugene, Oregon. I don't know how many of you have been there. Uh, that's uh, called Tracktown, USA, and that's uh, where the birthplace of Nike. So naturally, you get a lot of people running over this place which was a big puzzle for me until I read this theory. Why do you run? I mean, these people run for nothing, for no purpose. You know, they're just running around. They just, just, they're, they're just kept, you know. I mean, in my village, people run for a purpose. You run away from something bad, you run towards something good. No, but these people run around, you know, and doing nothing, and uh, wearing expensive shoes, just run around. And, and then you, in the wintertime, people go do something in Mount Hood in Oregon, that's near Portland. We have mountain of Mount Hood. People go up there, they pay a lot of money, go there, take this lift up to the top, the skin down. It's, it's dangerous, it's cold, it's expensive. Why would you do that thing? You know, it's stupid. Why, why would you do this? But, well, we love it. You know, just, uh, that's the people who enjoy exercising their body. Those are our ADHD students who gain energy from 
moving around. We don't learn the same way. We don't act the same way. Now, if we combine all of those, that really makes a very diverse group of students. The trouble is this. Traditional education has no use of that diversity. Traditional education, because we wanted the workers like this. We even teachers, even like teachers, we trivial as teaching. We, we treat you as more like a teaching machine rather than an educator. We want you to know this content. We want you to instruct the same way. Have you noticed that? We even have specifications of a good teacher should be like this. I mean, if we could really do that, we would have robotic teachers. Because we were making human beings to do mechanical jobs. That's all we're doing. Accountants, lawyers, remember all those things? You follow orders, you do certain things. So any diversity in this place, those things are useless. You may be an artist here, useless. Lady Gaga would be useless on this place. Think about how, how would you use her? She would cause trouble you know, on this, all this, this problem. No use. We don't want you to be creative. You know, when you go to a banker, we don't, we don't want you to be creative. That's what our education was designed to do. And that was all right until something happened in the 1970s. That was all right until 19 something happened in the 1970s. That's 1970s is what? Technology becomes more sophisticated. Computers become more sophisticated. And that has happened. This has happened. That's it. Automation. Today, Google's AlphaGo as a computer beat the, one of the best Go player, you know, Go, the game, in Korea, in Asian countries. It has already beaten the European champion in the grandmaster of Go, what's more complex. You know how hard that is? That's a very hard game. Computers now have become increasingly sophisticated. I don't need to explain too much. You just go drive around your coal loaders there. And imagine 100 years ago, People use jackhammers, use your space to dig out the coal, pour them over. Today, how many people do you see there? I was talking to Jiang yesterday driving around. Probably those freighters will not have crew members riding the boat anymore because, you know, they, they both can drive themselves. And if you have trouble, they can just fly people in because they have GPS. You know exactly where they are. You know, all those things happening. So as a result, almost all major professions have gone through massive changes. Accounting, we've reduced a lot of accountants. I was in actually uh, immigration officers. You go to Sydney, just last year, the, the immigration, we, you had a line of 30 immigration officers sitting there. Now you got one person sitting there, you know, you're doing with machines, you know, they, they do all those things. And even in so called complex domains, lawyers, America now has a surplus of law school graduates. Law school graduates. But don't worry, we're still suing each other as much as possible. We just don't need as many lawyers. It's very simple. The information is easy to get. And now we have, uh, have ideas like uh, a Google Car, just to give you a sense of this thing. By the way, at PwC, the Price Waterhouse Cooper released a report saying 44% of Australian jobs will be gone in 10 years. This is on top of a lot of jobs gone already. So, so when you see this, this, this kind of jobs, gone like a Google Car coming to you uh, without a driver, you notice this? It's coming. Have you seen the TV commercial car parks by itself? The car will be driving itself without a human driver. Jobs, taxi drivers, bus drivers, all the other drivers will be gone, but not only drivers. If you don't need drivers, you don't need driver's license. So your, your, your government issues driver's license will be gone. Driver's education will be gone. And then more of that, police will be gone. You don't need police. They have nobody to arrest, right? Remember, you, don't, you can drink and drive. I mean, it's just do whatever you like. You know, just uh, you cannot arrest Google. You know, just uh, it's uh, think about the, the others. Think about the, the, the changes. And once you do, you don't need a human driver. You don't need a steering wheel. If you don't need a steering wheel, you don't need the rear view mirror because you're not. You don't need that to sense. You don't need it. Then you don't need traffic lights. It's just all massive shifts. And and then car insurance will be gone. Not to individuals. You see all these kind of cascading changes. Now the question for us, what can we do to change this? What kind of people we need in the future and how do we change that? So I've painted a big scary picture. 
But actually, this is a good thing. Technology happens now. It's bad for those people in the process right now, those who've lost jobs. But education, we cannot lament on the idea that government is not creating new jobs and people are not creating. They can't. It's us. We have to create people to create jobs for themselves. So we need to look at the opportunities created by technology, not lament on the fact that took our jobs away. It's a machine's job anyway. Remember this one? Those were mechanical jobs. You don't want to do those jobs. Dangerous, deep in the mind. Do you want to do those jobs? You know, living away from your family, driving. You think driving from Newcastle to Sydney is a, night, is a good thing? You don't want to drive. You want to give away the machines. It's a good thing. Human beings now have been liberated from those jobs. So we need to reinvent ourselves. What kind of things? Let's look at opportunities. So let's take a look. Number one opportunity is, now technology has increased productivity and uh, gave us more leisure time. You know, compared to your grandparents 100 years ago, you still don't have enough money. Nobody has enough money forever, okay? But, but, but you have a lot more money now. You spend perhaps only half, less than half, of your income on necessities. Just ask yourself, how much money you spend on things that's necessary for survival? Food, shelter, and clothing. Every day, you just go home, take a look. You spend actually perhaps less than 30% on things that you absolutely need. I mean, given New Newcastle, you, need, you don't need a house. You can just sleep anywhere. You know, don't need that. You, say, you don't need any of this. You don't need clothes. And you can just go naked. And no problem. It's too hot anyway. So, you know, you think about the money you spend. But more important, you have more time in, on your hands. Teachers work very hard. You work very hard. But still, you probably each day has two to three hours of leisure time, plus the weekend. More leisure time, more disposable income. Once you get those two things, what do you do? You consume different products. You don't consume simply those kind of housing stuff. You consume things you want. You consume psychological, spiritual, and intellectual products. That is, you consume, you consume what you want not what you need. So just look at how much things you, you, you want. You just want them. You look at uh, the phone. Do you really need to change your phone every two years? No, but you want it. You know, you, you buy a phone. Do you need all these songs, 5,000 songs on your phone? No, but you want it, right? It's, uh, all the apps. Have you, how, many, how many people have you? You've taken more pictures than you have seen them, you know. Most of you have taken more photos. You've never seen them in themselves, right? You just want them. Nice. It's good. So psychological products are very personal. This is a big deal, okay? Psychological products are personal. If it's personal, it has to be diverse. So as a result of that, we consume what? We consume choice. We consume all kinds of choices. Just over the last 20 years, how many TV channels do you have now? How many cooking shows do you have now, right? Think about the choices you have. Choice. I would just tell you, just as in comparison, I came to America, you know, I went to America in 1990s, 1992, when China was just beginning to develop. So before I went to America, this was what I had to wash myself, everything, every inch of my body. So when I went to America, the first day I tried to buy something to wash my hair, just hope to say this, but I was confronted with this. I couldn't buy stuff to wash my hair because I first had to know what kind of hair I had. I, nobody told me what hair I had, right? Because this, I don't need this. Stuff. But now he said, oh, okay, now then you have, uh, do you notice how much, how big an industry the hair industry has become? Do you guys notice that? So to do this, do we need all this? No. Do we want them? Absolutely, right? Now you look at all these this things, choice. Who can create choice? It's all this diversity of people. They can create choice. And then if you look around this whole list, here, remember that intellectual differences, passion differences, how many different talents we need here? You need artists, designers, people who can coordinate things, people who love to organize things have a job here. Do you notice this? <laughs> and uh, singers, dancers, musicians, have you seen some com com shampoo commercial with someone dancing with it? You know, just you know, make you believe that you have to kind of, uh, you know, dance while you're washing your hair. That's, that's kind of, the, 
this the whole range of talents have become valuable. So this is a very important lesson to this. The opportunity has arrived that every talent, every inborn talent can become valuable. The whole spectrum of human talent can become valuable. That means traditional useless talent has become very useful. Traditional useless talent. Traditional useless people have become useful. The best example I gave you is Kim Kardashian. <laughs> traditional, she is completely useless in my village. <laughs> she may even be useless in most places. Do you know that? You know, I met her actually in Melbourne once. It was fun. It was, I saw her. This is, she's the only celebrity I've ever met. But she did not meet me. That was the problem. It says, uh, but we, we coexist in the same place in near uh, Yarra River in the Crown Plaza and the casino, the Crown Casino, in one of the hotels there. I was with Andy Hargroves there. And I don't know if Andy remembers this, but uh, we got in. Someone said, Kim is here. You guys get out of the lift. I said, okay, fine. Okay. And then I saw a lot of people hanging out there. And I said, who is that? And they said, Kim. I didn't know who Kim was. I, I asked my daughter. My daughter said, that's Kim Kardashian. I said, uh, what does she do? And my daughter said, she's a celebrity. I said, celebrity for what? It's nothing. <laughs> celebrity for nothing. That's why I wrote a book chapter. And Graham has the book called Celebrities for Nothing. It's, uh, we have lots of them. You didn't notice that? A lot of them. Today, most celebrities have done nothing including your musicians, writers, your football players. I know you love them, but they have done nothing. I mean, they don't produce food. They don't produce housing, remember? They produce entertainment. So Kardashian is no different than a bottle of shampoo. <laughs> but she has stayed out of her parents' basement. Do you notice that? I don't think she has a good education, but the, sex, the fact that she's independent says something. What does it mean? She satisfies someone's psychological needs. She satisfies someone. But then there's another way. That someone is out of a very small percentage. We call it niche talent. Very few people like her, actually. Very few people. Very few. Those who actually like her wouldn't even admit that they like her. But, but, but you know, just, just very few, percentage-wise. This is a new phenomenon. Again, opportunity called internet globalization. You have this long tail phenomena. That is, even though you appeal to only a very small percentage of people, when your base becomes so large, that group becomes very big. And before, if Kardashian lived in the village, 500 people, that's a large village already, even if 10% liked her of 500, that's 50 people. She might get 50 sweet potatoes, but won't survive. But now imagine she can reach with technology, globalization, TV, Vimeo, satellite, airplanes. She could reach 2 billion people. 1% of 2 billion is a lot. That's called a globalized situation. So now, number one lesson, if Kim Kardashian is useful, anyone can be useful. <laughs> now that's my lesson. So going back to think about your education. What's the number one thing we can do in schools? Is not to homogenize people. To admit that every one of this child can be valuable in their own right. So we do not need to fix them. We do not need to have a curriculum. We do not need to turn them into this. We need to turn them into greater, bigger in their own way. So my lesson number one today is to turn education from fix, fixing children's deficit to enhance their strength. Do not believe that we can prescribe something. Oh, I need to fix. You cannot read. Let me fix you so you can do something else. No. Don't fix that. Imagine there's a guy called Michael Phelps in the U.S., a great swimmer, and uh, he was not very good in the beginning as reading. You know, you, have you heard of this person, Michael Phelps? I know Australia has great swim teams, but, you know, they if we had to fix his reading before he could go swim, this guy would be hooked on phonics, still hooked on phonics in some basement. Right? You, you think about that. So do you want someone, like for me, for my son, I'm very happy he's out of my basement now. He's going to graduate school, had a very good game for employment. I'm happy he's going to become, honestly, a pretty good, even a great art historian. 
And that's much better than having him as possibly unemployed, mediocre, miserable economist. You see what I mean? This is a very good trade-off you have to think about as a parent or as a teacher. When you are fixing your children, you might be damaging them. This is in education, we call it side effects. You know, side effects of education. When you buy medicine, do you, know, you notice that? You should read this warning label. The medicine tells that, you know, this is Tylenol, can cure your runny nose, a headache, but, you know, may cause a bleeding stomach. Have you guys read those things? Those are dangerous stuff. Okay. Um, in education, have you ever read those warning labels? From government, from policy, from not plan, nobody reads them. I mean, some reading programs should really come with a warning label. Well, like direct instruction, for example. This can improve your phonemic awareness, raise your not plan scores, but may cause your children to hate reading forever. Have you seen those? No. They should, right? That's it. So when you are thinking about, when you are trying to fix somebody, are you really helping? Or are you supporting? So this is number one thing. We need to value all this diversity. This is the way to beat machines. Because machines cannot be unique. Machines are repetitive. Machines always are routine. Machines do not have this thing. Human beings in the age of machines need to be more human. Uniqueness is human. And the second thing about a human is creativity. We can always come up with new ideas. You know, human beings always do that. You always come with new ideas. That's human. We need to enhance the creativity of humanity. Creativity, as many people talk about creativity, most people believe creativity is cognitive. We train you to think differently. That might be true. But creativity is very task-specific. Action is more psychological and emotional. You learn not to be creative because human beings are born to have the capacity to be creative. In fact, our schools, we stifle creativity. We don't want our children to be creative. We view children who are kind of like this. We call this kid, he's not ready for school because he's kind of doing something different, not fitting the standards. So that's why it was school. When children are born, they're all creative. 98% of children are creative at the genius level when they're age five. When they become better students in schools after five years, we lose 60% of that. Then as you age, you go through middle school, age 15, 10% left, you go to high school, graduate in life, 2% left. After retirement, your creativity can bounce back. What does that mean? It's emotional. It means it's psychological. You learn not to, you know, after your retirement, I don't care anymore. You know, what, you know. Uh, you learn not to be creative because a lot of times in traditional society, coming, out, coming up with different ideas are not rewarded. So now, how do we support our children's creativity? This is very important to think about. Okay? I don't, wait, don't make them wait until retirement. How do you support in our classroom? A lot of times, because our traditional curriculum, our traditional curriculum, traditional content, you have a specific content, you have a specific answer, you reward correct answers. You don't reward questions. In, the imagine, you know, in our classroom, we teach children we always want them to give us the answers back. And in a way, we want them to give us back. Remember this? Like children say, what's the capital of China? Children will say, well, maybe Guangzhou. You say, wrong. You know, think again. In real life, do you ever deal with people like this? Say, oh, honey, where do you want to go have dinner tonight? Well, let's go to the Italian place. Wrong. Think again. <laughs> that's, not, that's not real. That's not genuine. We don't think about it. We, fake, we trick children into understanding what we want them to do. We teach compliance. There's very good research showing that how we compliant children learn. Children from very early on, they pick up from you. There's like a, a several psychological studies now showing that direct instruction give children knowledge faster, but they lose creativity faster. So how not to kill creativity. And then finally, when human beings, another, human beings are always able to be entrepreneurial. We like to solve problems. Once you solve problems, you create value for other people. You know? However, again, schools don't encourage entrepreneurial people. Schools don't like that. You know, what do we do? We teach you to do work. 
which schools is like a factory. We want children to become employees. Do you notice they come at 9 o'clock, they clock in, they immediately get put onto one fragmented task. Go do this math, then come back, and at the end of the day, if you finish right, you get paid with a grade. That's how you do it. So children learn to say, I will do whatever you want. Have you noticed children always come and ask you, so Mr. Smith, how many pages do you want this essay to be? Remember that? They're asking, so five. What? Double space, single space. <laughs> What font? Remember those things? I mean, universities have kids go there. It's like a job. You negotiate with a job. An entrepreneur never do that. They will say, okay, hey, and the entrepreneur students come to say, hey, you know, um, Mr. Smith, I'm really going to try to set up this uh, coffee shop, and I don't know how to do this math. Can you help me with that? That's entrepreneur thinking. And entrepreneurs do not have to be business entrepreneurs. Entrepreneurs are simply people who like to treat problems as opportunities. That's entrepreneurs are of different kinds. We have uh, social entrepreneurs as well. People who like to solve a big problem. I was working with a group of schools in Melbourne. There's a bunch of two girls from uh, uh, Melbourne Girls College. They are bordering the Yarra River. They want to clean the Yarra River. And they were designing. So remember, from a class project, they said, we want to clean the Yarra River. They had models. How to do I said, no, well, that's not interesting. That's a class project. I said, if you go there, build a company, or build a non-profit organization, invent new ways to collect, clean the Yarra River, that's much more meaningful. And then you can involve people who are good at art, who are going to promote this, who are good at talking to others through fundraising, who are good at science and engineering to make the tools to do this. That's much more interest. That's called social entrepreneurs. If you don't like something, poverty, let's say, is a big problem. How do you address poverty? Schools always say, let's go raise money, give some money. That's no good. If you help people to develop enterprises, that's different with address it. Our children can do this. You create value for other people, for the world. And entrepreneurs, that's people working within companies. Like you know, those people who, even if like Apple, Google are hiring people, they're not hiring graduates. You know, Google has now 14% of employees without a college degree. And now many companies now say, well, don't show me your degree. Don't show me your GPS. That only shows you've been a good student. Nothing else. Apple says that if you want to be employed, if you want to be managed, if you want to be managed, you're not employable. It's, they want you to solve problems. Identify problems worth solving. When you're policy entrepreneurs, that's when you're bureaucrats. But, uh, you know, and... So now you want to bring back together what makes us human. Uniqueness, creative, entrepreneurial. And of course, you can talk about all the different talents, all those things. I, I actually assumed all of this would be dealt with. So how do we change our education, our paradigm? How do we keep our kids out of our basement? Remember those things? We have to educate our children to become opportunity and job creators. So that is, I have a paradigm called, we shift the schooling from fixing children's deficit, homogenous children, in, into enhancing individual talents, individual passion, we follow the child. So I have come up with, with a model called the three model. I, I heard that Graham sounds like some of you may be reading my book called, the, you know, you can see this. Student autonomy. Let's get rid of um, national curriculum, state curriculum, whatever curriculum you think. It's follow the child. Develop. Develop a curriculum for each child. Personalized education. Truly personalized education. Not personalized by you, personalized by children. We support the individual students. This is the idea from this book called uh, Todd Rose. So, you know, we try to create opportunity for every individual child by asking them what they're good at, what they're not good at, what they're passionate about. We enable that to happen. So that as part, that of, part of that, we have three things to think about. Student autonomy. Do you give students enough voice? Do students get to talk about what kind of rules we should have in the school? Do students get to decide, can I skip that class if I don't want to? Can students nominate, I would like to take this class. Can you offer that to me? And we also change that students to, from, you know, to, Teaching, by the way, teaching, teachers will never be replaced by machines. But certain jobs, certain functions of teachers will be replaced by machines. Instructional piece of it. You don't want to compete with Google or, 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 or YouTube, okay? That's why, again, I wrote another book called Let, 
never seen a human to do a machine's job. Imagine your life right now. A lot of jobs you're doing can be done by machines. We need you to become mentors, supporters, take care of the social, emotional aspect of children, not the instructional piece. They can learn, children, but they need the guidance, they need the support. And the second thing I would suggest that we change our teaching from just in case to just in time. You know, right now, all our teaching is just in case. You learn this thing by year one because you might need this in year two, and you might need this in gra when you graduate. And a lot of times convince children, oh, you got to learn this thing. Maybe in work you need. This child is five years old. They think about work. You know, and they, they can't do that. What we need to do is change our, our teaching into supporting students making meaningful work. Because by making meaningful work, they also develop creativity and entrepreneurial thinking. They're turning their uniqueness and creativity into value to other people. I actually, many people think, oh, problem-solving skills is very important. I say, yeah, maybe. But problem identification skills are much more important. Do you know what problem is worth solving? Now, you can probably make some machine to do it. Or you can hire somebody to solve your problem if it's worth solving. Okay? So that's how you change the idea. So are we making authentic? Ask yourself in your class, are you making authentic things? Your, your children spend 12 years working on something. Most of the stuff is not authentic. You know, we print our children's books. I was working with some schools in, uh, in, in Western Sydney, too. Children write books, print books. We send to parents. We really don't mean to have parents read them. We just want to show we've written. Those books were not authentic. They serve the writer, serve the students more than serve a genuine purpose. What if we change this? Okay, our children are going to write iBooks, interactive multimedia books for students who are learning English in China. That shifted authenticity. You write for purpose. Right now, the only writing purpose was using for, for student give a grades. Think about how do you do sustained creativity in the drafts, you need to learn to be great, identify your strength, and finally understand that like Kim Kardashian does so well. We have a global, a global market, a global place we need to help others, a place we can learn from, with, and for each other on a global scale. So all of this come back together. We need a paradigm shift. We cannot just continue to fix this. We can't fix this. You know, this, that's why our government has been doing it around them. We try to fix the improve the curriculum. Let's have a better curriculum. We try to fix teachers. Remember, they're trying to fix to improve teachers. We blame teachers. They're, you know, I don't know, I don't know about Australia. In the US, there's a general belief Teachers are the dumbest people in the population. You have that one? Because we bring them from the lowest you know, per percentile of graduates in terms of ATA scores, other scores. That's wrong. It's, we try to fix it. You did not sign up to be changed. You know, all this professional development, improvement, account, they're not treating you as human educators. We trivialize teaching as knowledge transmission, but you're educators. We do not fix you. We empower you to become human educators. To work with kids, we try to fix testing. This is a better testing with technology. There's no better assessment, testing. What we need to change is completely abandon this then. It's like this, in, you know, in, in technology, we've seen this. Remember this thing? This is this, well, you can't tell what it, no, you can't tell. What is this, do you know this thing, this guys? Have you seen this? Remember Nokia phone? Do you remember them? You still have them? No, good. And, and these guys were the largest cell phone maker. They were adding smartphone features. Do you know that? But overnight, they were replaced by the smartphones. Why? Because that improvement has a limit. When you face a paradigm shift, that improvement doesn't work anymore. They were adding smart features on the stupid phone system instead of inventing a smartphone. Education has arrived at a time we cannot improve our way to the future now. So we have to abandon the idea of improving curriculum, teaching, pedagogy. Oh, we got complete, complete shifting the idea of following our child. Support our children to be human, to be creative, to be entrepreneurial. If we did all of that, they will stay out of our basement. Thank you. Thank you.